Good morning again. The goal and aim for the life of a Christian is to know God. Everything else flows from this point. Obedience, worship, evangelism, all of it flows from the starting point of knowing God. Because if we do not know God, then everything else falls flat. Knowing God is the starting point for everything else that we do. Without which we have no foundation. We have nothing to stand on. Tell me what you stand on in bringing others to Christ if you do not know God. Tell me what you stand on in the faith against a tide of darkness coming at us if you don't know who you're standing for. Knowing God is the starting point. (coughs) Excuse me. From which all else flows. We read just a little bit ago in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, Exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight. Hosea records in chapter 6 and verse 6 also from God, God saying, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Which I think is a fairly incredible statement in the Old Testament. God desires the knowledge of himself more than the sacrifices being made. Because without the knowledge of God, what good are the sacrifices? Without the knowledge of God, what's the point? Otherwise, you're just cooking some meat. It's true. You're just making a meal. I can do that in my kitchen. (coughs) Or on my grill. I don't cook in the kitchen too much. I grill a lot, though. But God himself says he desires the knowledge of himself more than burnt offerings. In John chapter 17, Jesus, praying for himself at this point, (coughs) <coughs> and for those who would come after him. John records that Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this, he says, this is eternal life. So pay attention. When Jesus says, this is eternal life, pay attention. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And when Jesus says that something is eternal life, we should probably zero in on that. He says, this is the eternal life, that they know you, and that they know me. And so we have to ask the question, what does it mean to know something? Because we, we, we kind of use that phrase flippantly, like, oh, I know that person, when really we know them because we've seen them walking down the street several times while we've driven by in our car. 
I know the kind of strange gentleman that walks down North 2nd a lot because I see him every other day. Yeah, I know that guy. Well, I know him as far as I see him. But I don't know him. And we also have to admit that it's that the more complex the object, the more complex the knowing of it is. I know this row of chairs really well. Because I see them every week. I see them almost every day. I know they're comfortable. They're rarely sat in. They're made of metal and cloth and board. I know that's about the extent that you can know a chair. <clears throat> Knowing an animal is a little bit more complex. I know our cat, Scully, how she behaves, and I know, also know that when you try to stuff her into a kennel, she'll freak out and scratch you. It's happened twice in two weeks. We know that knowing an animal is more complex than knowing a chair, right? We also know that knowing a person is a whole other ballgame. People are different. You see, people keep secrets. And you can only know a person as much as they allow you to know them. You can only know me as much as I let you know about me. And I can only know you as much as you allow me to know. And in a relationship, our job is to open up and show attention and interest to the person. And really, the, from that point on, the rest is on them. I can be as attentive um, and interested in someone as I want, but unless they divulge themselves to me, I'm not going to know them. This is why before people get married, they spend usually a lot of time together. So they have time to divulge themselves to each other, to open themselves to each other so they can know each other before they get married. This is especially true with someone in a position of higher authority than we are. If someone isn't, has a great deal higher authority than we do, we have no claim on their friendship. We have no claim on saying, well, you better let me get to know you. Because they're the ones in authority. They're the ones with the power. And to say all this to make a point, because there's something very, very important that we need to understand, and that is that God desires us to know him. Now think about that for a minute. God desires us to know him. And we need to realize, we need to realize, that in Scripture, God speaks to you. That he opens himself to you. That he enlists your aid in having his plans realized. These are all action words. These are all things that someone does in order to get to know them. And the God of the universe, the God of all creation, the one who said, let there be light and there was, says, hey, I want to get to know you. I want you to think for a moment of a person, but not just any person, I want you to think of a person in a position of great authority or power that you respect. So, someone in, in some sort of position that is above you, that you respect that person, you look up to them. And consider how your reaction would be if they came to you and said, hey, I want to bring you into my inner circle. I want to bring you into my plans. I want to utilize your talents and the effort and your efforts to bring to fruition the plans that I have. Would you be excited about that? We say, hey, 
this is pretty cool. This is pretty, they, they, you might even tell some people, holy smokes, you might tell some people, hey, so-and-so brought me into their circle and wants, to, wants me to carry out their, help carry out their plans. So then how much more should that take hold in realizing that God acts this way towards us? But God says to us, hey, I'm going to bring you into my plans. I'm going to bring you into my inner circle. I'm going, I'm going to utilize talents and efforts that I've given you the ability to do in order to carry out my plans for this planet. Because that's exactly what he does. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, tells them, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will, will receive his own reward according to his own labor. And this is the part, this, the, this verse I want us to zero in on. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. It says that we're fellow workers with God. In our day and age, we call that co-workers, right? Someone we work with to achieve a common goal. God says, hey, those who are working with me, they're my fellow workers. And those, that, and those that they are working with are his field, his building, what, we, what he uses in order to do his will. What is a field? What is a building? A field is, a, is an area that we utilize to carry out a sp our task, right? Right? If you're a farmer and you have a field, that is what you're using to carry out your task of growing crops. And God says, hey, that's what you are. He says, you're the one, you're, you're what I'm using to carry out my task. You're what I'm using to carry out my plans. It's the same with a building, right? Right? A building is a place of use made to carry out a plan or a task. God says, hey, you're my fellow workers. You're my field. You're my building. You're what I'm using to carry out my task. And yet, he also says that we're even more than that. Matthew chapter 12, verses, starting verse 46. Matthew writes that while Jesus was, still, Jesus was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood, up, stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then someone said, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside waiting to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hands toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. He literally says that we are the family of Jesus Christ the Messiah. Those who do, his, do the will of his Father in heaven are Jesus his own family, his sisters, his brothers, his mothers, his family.
So not only are we God's fellow workers, not only are we those who God uses to bring to fruition His plans, but as many as follow the will of our Father in heaven, He says, are my family. Are the family of Jesus. And let's, how's the, how's, the saying, how's the old saying go? No one knows you like family knows you. If Jesus is going to say that we are his family, then by definition, he knows us. And by definition, we should know him. But we must involve ourselves in those things that knowing God involves. If we're going to know someone, then we have to involve ourselves in the activities that allow us to get to know someone, right? Just like the guy who walks down North 2nd, I can't really say I know him because I haven't involved myself in any activities that get me to know him. But if we stop and do so, then we'll in all likelihood get to know them. <clears throat> and with God, it means that we must listen to God's word and receive it by the Holy Spirit in application to ourselves. I'm not saying, oh well, excuse <coughs> me. Well, Jesus said, hey, here are my mother and my brothers, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Well, that's nice, so we're gonna put it out here in the cloud somewhere, but it has no real effect on me. If we're going to involve ourselves in knowing God, then we have to take what he says and says and ask and ask then, well, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us as we follow Christ? We have to ask that question. Because in God's Word, He has revealed Himself to us. And if He has revealed Himself to us, then we must also note God's nature and character as revealed in His Word and in His works. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. We said earlier how getting to know another person really depends on them. That you can only get to know someone as far as they allow you to. You're only going to really know me as, as far as I divulge myself to you. Let's be honest. And I will only know you as far as you divulge yourself to me. There's a reason I know my wife better than I know Ned. Got to look up at me. Because of the nature of the relationship between me and my wife, we divulge ourselves to each other, we open ourselves to each other far more than, for example, me and Marsha would. Or me and Joey do. We only know someone as far as they divulge themselves to us. And God in His Word has divulged Himself to us. He has shown us Himself by His Word and by His works. He says, this, these are my plans. This is who I am. This is how I act. These, this is how I react to different situations. And if we're going to know God, we must take note of His nature and character as He reveals it. So as we said, our job in a relationship is to open ourselves up to the is to open ourselves with attention and interest to the one we wish to know. And if we're going to know God, we must open our attention and interest to Him as He has revealed Himself in Scripture. 
And in doing so, we must accept his invitation to do what he commands. Notice Jesus did, G Jesus did not say, Everyone is my brother and sister and mother. He said, Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. If we were to look at this in the, in the negative way, then the other way to look at this would be, whoever does not do the will of my Father in heaven is not my brother and sister and mother. It's a two-way street. Knowing God involves accepting his invitation to do what he commands, to do what he has called us to do, to be who he has called us to be. And in so doing, we can recognize and rejoice in the love He has shown in drawing us to Himself. We can rejoice in the fact that He has called us to follow Him. We can rejoice in the fact that He has paid the price to make us His. And that He has opened that invitation to every human who has ever lived on the planet. And, whoever, and all who are going to live in the future. His invitation is for all. His invitation is for you and is for me. It's for those that we like and for those we can't stand. It is for those we think are great and those we think are terrible. The invitation is for all and we can rejoice in the love He has shown in doing so. Because knowing God involves a relationship where we look up to Him and we are loved for and cared for by Him. The Bible describes this relationship as that of a son with a father, as a subject to a king, as a sheep to a shepherd. Where one is taken care of and provided for by the one in authority. where we look up to Him who gives us all. And in so doing, we need to realize that knowing God involves us personally. It involves me personally. It involves you personally. Knowing God is a matter of personal dealing of dealing with God on a personal basis. And we must deal with God regarding the practical application of truth to life. This goes back to what we were saying earlier. Where we look at what God has revealed in His Word and we actively apply that to who we are. What we say, what we do, how we react to things. And furthermore, knowing God is a matter of personal involvement. See, knowing God requires the use of the mind and the will and the emotions. We recognize this in our personal human relationships. If we do not pay someone any mind, then we're not going to care about them in the first place. If we do not exercise a will to get to know them, well, then when, when the first bad thing comes along, we're just going to give up, go our own way. We have to actively pursue that. If we cut out all emotional aspect of knowing someone, if we close ourselves off from, from them emotionally, we recognize that that's Extremely unhealthy in a relationship. Tell me how good your, the relationship goes with your spouse when you cut yourself off from them emotionally. Not good. We have marital counseling for things like that because people recognize it as a problem. And to dismiss 
or ignore any one of these, mind, will, or emotion, is to neuter the relationship. It's to cripple, it's to hobble the relationship. <coughs> Excuse me. And this doesn't mean that we're going to have all three in equal measure all the time. But it does mean that we do not cut ourselves off from one, uh, from one aspect of knowing God because it feels uncomfortable. Or because so-and-so, you know, so-and-so did that and they just went way off the deep end. If we're going to know God personally, we must use all avenues of knowing Him just as we would anyone else. But we're human and we're weak, which is why it's a great, great thing that knowing God is a matter of grace. It's a matter of grace. See, we do not make, as, um, as Packer writes, we do not make friends with God. God makes friends with us. Well, as Paul writes in Romans, when we were still enemies, Christ died for us. When we were still with sin, Jesus came to die and make us whole. We're not the ones who, who came and said, hey, God, you're going to be my friend. And God saw a world being destroyed by sin and corruption and said, I'm going to be their friend. Earlier on, we said that someone in, higher author someone in a higher authority than us we have no claim on their friendship. I have no claim on the friendship of the president or the speaker of the house. I have no claim on the friendship and companionship of those in a higher authority than me. In the same way, I have no claim on God to say, hey, you're going to be my friend whether you like it or not. I don't have that authority. And yet, God says that He will make friends with us. And not only will He make friends with us, He'll pay whatever price it takes to make that happen. Which is why we have Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, God incarnate, living among us. turning away temptation at every turn, spilling His lifeblood as a perfect sacrifice to make us whole and complete so we could become the children and friends of God. And what I love about all of this is that God's knowledge of us includes the good and the bad and the ugly. His love for us is utterly realistic with a full understanding of who we are. God's not going to wake up tomorrow and say, Ho! Oh, I, I didn't realize that about Ken. He's out. Like, you're not going to trick him. And he's not going to be surprised by something in your past. See, Jesus paid that price knowing full well what he was doing. Knowing full well what he was getting into. And yes, this is greatly humbling. But can also, should be, greatly energizing and drawing us to worship the God who desires to be my friend, your friend, my Father, your Father, my King, your King, my God, your God. Understand, my brothers and sisters, that God knows us. 
He knows all your shiny spots. He knows all your deepest, darkest areas. God knows us. And in return, let us know and live for Him. This I desire more than burnt offerings, that they know me. Knowing God is a starting point for everything else. But it's a starting point that you don't reach without the blood of Jesus washing over your sins. Knowing God starts by meeting that blood in the waters of baptism. And there's no use in saying, oh, well, when I get better, then I'll do it. When I have things figured out, then I'll take care of it. The invitation is for sinners now. Just like the constant invitation for those who are His, <clears throat> but who struggle with knowing Him, who struggle with opening themselves completely to Him, who struggle walking the path that Christ has laid before him. The call is constantly there. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden. And I'll give you rest. The call is for now. It's not for someday. The question is this, will we answer it? Will we answer it and know the God who knows us? Will we do it now while we stand, while we sing?